All right, so we're gonna be looking at the cardiovascular system and we're gonna do a little review over the structures of this system and then we're gonna get into some of the diseases and disorders. So when we look at the review, of course, this is an anatomy and physiology part of a review. Remember that the cardiovascular system does contain the heart, the blood vessels, which include the arteries and the veins, and blood. Okay, those are the components. Now guys, when we're talking about the heart, remember the heart is about the size of your fist. Okay, so it's about the size of your fist. It's located slightly to the left in the middle of your chest. So when you look here, it's not right here in the middle, it's off to the left just a little bit. It is sandwiched though between your two lungs. It is composed of a special kind of muscle called cardiac muscle. It has four chambers. These four chambers are separated by structures that we call valves. And I'm gonna to talk to you about these chambers, these valves and how blood moves in just a moment. Now, the wall of the heart is composed of three layers of tissue. The innermost layer is known as the endocardium. The endo tells you it's the inside layer. We then see the middle layer is called the myocardium. This is the layer that is going to be the cardiac muscle. And then the outer layer is the epicardium. And the epicardium is an extension of the pericardium, which is that cavity that is around the heart that has that fluid. And the whole point of that cavity is to reduce friction as the heart beats. So I'm gonna kinda do this little simple diagram type picture of how the heart looks with its chambers and valves, as well as how blood flows through these structures. Now, this is not necessarily anatomically correct in the sense of like where the valves and stuff are located. This is a very simplified type of version, but I hope it gives you kind of the gist of how blood flows through. And remember that this is kind of two circulatory type systems. We have one that's the pulmonary side. This is from the right side of the heart to the pulmonary, then back to the left side of the heart. And then we have from the left side to the rest of the body, which is the systemic circulation, back to the right side. You'll also notice that I'm gonna use arrows that are color-coded. If the arrows are blue, this is showing you that, that that blood is deoxygenated. It does not have a lot of oxygen in it. And if the arrows are red, it does have oxygen present. So we're gonna start first with the chambers. So we have a right atria and a left atria and we have a right ventricle and the left ventricle. The atrias are the two top chambers and the ventricles are the two bottom chambers. These chambers are separated by what we call a septum. There's a divide, okay? So there's a septum between each atria and there's a septum between each ventricle. Now there is a connection through valves where the right atria is connected to the right ventricle and the left atria is connected to the left ventricle. The valve between the right atria and the right ventricle is known as the tricuspid valve. And the valve between the left atria and the left ventricle is known as the bicuspid valve. It also gets the name a lot of times as the mitral valve. Now one way to remember this, guys, is that a lot of times you try before you buy. Okay, so this is telling you the tricuspid valve's on the right side of the heart, the bicuspid valve follows on the left side of the heart. We then have some special valves that are going to allow the blood to leave the ventricles. These valves are going to allow the blood to leave the heart and go to either the pulmonary circulation or the systemic circulation. So on the right side, we see that we have the pulmonary semilunar valve. This is the valve that the blood leaves through from the right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation. On the other side, you have the left ventricle. The blood's gonna leave through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta and go to the systemic circulation. All right, so let's talk about how the blood would move. We're gonna start with the blood in the right atria. This blood is deoxygenated, therefore it is blue. It's gonna travel through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The blood then is gonna leave the right ventricle and go through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary arteries. Now arteries always carry blood away from the heart. This blood then is gonna go into the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, the pulmonary capillaries are going to be where the blood vessels are going to come in contact with the alveoli and the lungs and gas exchange is gonna take place. This is when the blood is gonna pick up oxygen. The blood then goes into the pulmonary veins and then back to the heart. However, it's going to the left side now. You'll notice that these arrows are red because they have picked up oxygen. The blood has picked up oxygen. 
And also veins carry blood toward the heart. Now that we're in the left side of the heart, we see the blood is gonna go from the left atria to the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve. The blood will then leave the heart from the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta. The aorta that is going to distribute the blood through the systemic arteries to all the rest of the tissues in your body and then to the systemic capillaries. These systemic capillaries are gonna be where gas exchange is gonna take place. The oxygen is gonna be dropped off to your tissues and carbon dioxide is gonna be picked up. Now the blood is deoxygenated. It's gonna to return to the heart through the systemic veins and specifically the vena cava. The vena cava then dumps the blood back into the right atria and then we can start over. So if you notice, it has, this has like two kind of loops to it. We have the pulmonary side of the circulation. We have the systemic side of the circulation. This is just a way to try to help you remember and it gives you kind of a simplified picture view. Another thing we need to review is how the heart pumps the blood through the system and the fact that it uses these electrical signals in order to actually contract the cardiac muscle. Now it does this through a series of specialized cells that are going to be self-exciting cells and they start in what we call the SA node, okay, or the sinoatrial node. This is a special group of cells that's found in the right atria of the heart and they are going to be the actual natural pacemaker of your heart. They're the ones that are going to send out the signal of depolarization to the atria. It's also going to send the signal then to the AV node. The AV node is going to be the connection between the atria and the ventricles. This is going to be where the signal is going to wait just a second to allow the atria to contract first while the ventricles are relaxed and then it's going to tell the ventricles to contract so that when the atria relax the ventricles contract so your heart's actually going to be doing this kind of number with its contractions the av node is going to send the signal down the av bundle this bundle goes between this in the septum between the two ventricles this branches into a right and left bundle branch. These are then going to go to the apex or the heart, the very point, and then they're going to come back up through what we call these small fibers called Purkinje fibers. The electrical signal then is going to tell the ventricles to contract from the bottom up. This way they can force the blood to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Now if you take a look, this electrical signal that you see here, we can actually visualize it when we hook somebody up to what we call an ECG or an EKG, an electrocardiogram. This is gonna give us a series of waves and you do need to know that these waves are important and the way that they look is also important. If this wave looks abnormal, then something could be going on with the heart. So we have the P wave first. The P wave is when the atria are getting ready to contract. They then contract from the P wave to the Q. At the Q wave, we see that the atria then will start to relax. At the Q, QRS is when the ventricles are going to contract. They are then going to rest when the T wave begins. The T wave allows them to relax and the whole heart is relaxed at this point before the next P wave, co P wave comes along which allows the atria to contract again. Right? And so that's what you'll see there on an EKG. Another thing that we see that you can detect is going to be pulse. Now when we're looking at the pulse, guys, there's a number of different areas that you can take pulse at. The kind of most common two that we see is of course here and that's the carotid. And then also a lot of times here at the wrist, which is the radial. Those are the two that we tend to use most often when we're talking about like exercise. If you're like in a class and they say, hey, you need to take your pulse. That's normally where we get it from. However, there's a couple of other places you could take it. You have a temporal pulse right here. And a lot of times we feel that pulse when we have a headache okay, and we can actually feel it with every heartbeat. Another one is the brachial pulse, which is going to be right here in the elbow. There's the femoral in the leg, the popliteal behind the knee, and then the pedal in the foot. 
Now, a lot of times, guys, those areas, when we talk about the femoral, the popliteal, and the pedal, we don't actually take the pulse there, like if you're checking someone's pulse to see if they're alive. But it would be important to check those, especially if an injury has happened that affects their lower extremities, where we want to make sure blood flow is still going to those lower extremities. Because if blood flow is not, it could cause other complications to take place. And we could even lose limbs if there's not blood flow to those particular areas. Now, remember when we are feeling a pulse, we are feeling that pulse through arteries. Arteries are going to be able to sustain the high pressure with each heartbeat. And that's what you're feeling is the arteries actually distending and then coming back to their original shape. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about this difference between the arteries and veins in a second. So guys, if we take a look here, you have where the arteries and veins are going to connect. These are known as the capillary beds. The capillaries are going to be where gas exchange takes place, as well as the exchange of other nutrients that your tissues may need. The arteries, again, remember, are going to be vessels that are going away from the heart, and veins are going to be the vessels going back toward the heart. A lot of times they're represented as arteries are blue, veins, sorry, arteries are red and veins are blue, but this is not always the case. When we talk about the pulmonary arteries and veins, those colors are reversed because they have not picked up the oxygen yet. Another thing we need to look at with arteries and veins is their structure. You will notice that they each have three layers of tissue present. They are called the tunica externa, the tunica media and the tunica interna or intima. When we look at this guys, tunica means covering or like coat. And so this is a covering around the vessel and we see that the external one is going to be pretty thick in both of them, okay? But if you'll notice the middle layer, the media, it is a lot thinner in the vein versus the artery. Now there's a reason for this. It is because the artery has to be able to withstand high pressures coming from the heart, the pumping of the heart. The vein does not. Okay, and so because of this, you're going to see that the artery has a larger layer of muscle and it's going to have a lot more elastic fibers present. And this is to help it accommodate that stretching that takes place due to the high pressure. Veins don't have this because they're further away from the heart. These veins also are going to need some special structures that are going to help get the blood back to the heart and fight against gravity. A couple of things that help with this are little valves that help push the blood forward and then keep it from going backwards. They catch it in a sense, as well as using different muscles to help move the blood forward. This is one reason why it's so important for somebody to become mobile or as mobile as possible after a major surgery or injury because we want to keep the blood flowing. Okay, we don't want it to pull in those veins. And so mobility and movement of the muscles helps move that blood. All right, guys, some common signs and symptoms that we see in cardiovascular disorders or diseases are things like chest pain. A lot of times if we're having issues with blood vessels or even the heart, we're going to see chest pain as part of this. This pain can be very severe where individuals will talk about a major pressure on their chest, like they'll feel like an elephant is sitting on it. But it could also be very mild where they think they just have indigestion, okay? but it could be their heart that's actually having some of that pain. Another thing that we see that is pretty common is shortness of breath. The shortness of breath could be due to a hypoxic type of event or ischemia where blood flow is hindered in some way and so your body is trying to get more oxygen into the body so it's going to affect the, your breathing causing it to be a little more shallow and where you're trying to like suck in that air. We also see that the heart could be used to try to pump the blood faster because of that and that's tachycardia. And sometimes as well, the heart will actually pump so hard that the patient can really feel it. It's almost like the heart is coming out of their chest. That's what they'll kind of explain it as. And those are known as cardiac palpitations, okay, where they can actually really feel that heartbeat. Now, guys, there are other things that we see. The chest pain doesn't always just stay in the chest. A lot of times it can radiate down the left arm as well as up into the neck and the jaw. We also see that some other signs that we look at are sweating edema or swelling. There could also be some nausea and vomiting, especially if the pain is really great. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of hit because a lot of the stuff we're going to be looking at, a lot of these signs and symptoms you're going to see that are, that are present. 
Another thing we want to look at before we get into actual specific disorders is what we would actually use as diagnostic tools for the cardiovascular system. When we're looking at some of these diagnostic tools, we want to look at some of them as being non-invasive procedures. Non-invasive procedures mean that they can be done without really kind of harming or invading the patient's body in any way. All right, there's not going to be any kind of healing or recovery that has to take place after a non-invasive procedure. Now, the first one that we see are auscultations. This is actually listening. And so we do this with a stethoscope. We listen to the heart. We listen to the blood vessels. Okay, and we utilize that in order to kind of get a, a picture based on sound of what's going on. We can also use a Doppler for some of these kind of smaller vessels. What they can do is they can put a Doppler on there and it will actually be able to read out each of those pulse rates or the heartbeat as that stretch in the arteries take place. We can also look for arterial blood pressure. This is where we put that blood pressure cuff. Now we take the blood pressure with the arteries because that's going to be able to be detected. Veins have such low pressure that we cannot use that for a blood pressure reading. We also see that we could use an electrocardiogram. This is known as an ECG or an EKG. These are important because they give us a good picture of how the heart is functioning and that whole idea of those P, Q, R, S, and T waves. We could also do an echo. We can do an echocardiography, and this is where we're going to use an ultrasound type of technique to get a picture of the heart. Okay, this allows us to look at closer at each chamber to see if it is pumping the blood and blood moving properly through the heart. Another thing we can do is do a PET scan. When you do a PET scan, it gives you a, an idea of sections, so we can kind of pinpoint if a certain part of the system is not working properly. So these are considered the non-invasive. Now things that are a little more invasive are going to be things like the cardiac catheterization. This is an invasive procedure to determine the oxygen content as well as the blood pressure internally of whether the is, we're looking at the vessels or the heart. And they guys, they do this by putting in a little catheter through the vessels and it goes into each chamber of the heart in order to read out that information. We then see x-rays and you're thinking, wait, x-rays are normally not very invasive. However, x-rays are used to see hard parts, okay? When we're looking at blood vessels, those are soft tissue. And so when we talk about it being a little more invasive, this is because you're gonna have to use dye in order to get a picture like you see here. The dye is injected. This allows us then to have a good, better picture of how the blood vessels are running through that tissue. Now we can look specifically at the heart vessels. It could also be the arteries or they could look directly at the veins. Blood tests are another kind of diagnostic tool that we can use, especially when we're talking about heart attacks or myocardial infarctions. This includes looking for certain enzymes in the blood. This includes creatine phosphokinase or CPK and lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. These two types of enzymes get released when cardiac muscle has been damaged or is dying. When that happens, they release these, these enzymes into the bloodstream and we can detect them. This lets us know if that if a heart attack has happened or maybe even is currently happening. All right, so these are some of those different tests that could be utilized. Now guys, cardiovascular disease is known as CVD and it is the leading cause of death in the United States. It actually affects one in every four Americans. So it's a really big deal. High blood pressure is the most common cause of cardiovascular disease. So lots of individuals are gonna be dealing with hypertension or high blood pressure. Now, through this presentation, in different parts, we're going to discuss diseases of the arteries, we're gonna look at diseases of the heart, the veins, trauma, and then some rare diseases or disorders. And so we're gonna break this up into, some, or into multiple sections to help keep the videos short.